Yes, this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we look at the sweeping anti-immigrant crackdown in Florida, led by the Republican Governor Ron DeSantis, expected this week to announce his candidacy for the 2024 presidential race. The American Civil Liberties Union Monday filed a lawsuit against Florida over a new property law signed by DeSantis that restricts immigrants from buying homes in the state if they're born in China. China and also targets those from Cuba, Venezuela, Syria, Iran, Russia and North Korea. The ACLU says the new law, quote, harkens back to the anti-Asian land laws of the past century. Those laws violated the fundamental right to equal protection, just like Florida's does. The legislation takes effect July 1st along with another anti-immigrant law that LULAC, that's the League of United Latin American Citizens, has called hostile and dangerous, and prompted it to issue a travel advisory for the state, along with the NAACP. The law bans people who are undocumented from using driver's licenses issued in other states, and prohibits state ID cards to be issued to them. It requires hospitals accept Medicaid to that accept Medicaid to ask about people's citizenship status during intake, which could stop undocumented community members from seeking medical care. It also expands requirements for employers to use the federal e-verify system to check the immigration status of their workers. Immigrant farm workers and others have walked off the job in protest of the new law. It is very sad and unfortunate. They called us today because the painters and the people who do the cement all went to work in another state. In other videos on social media, truck drivers are calling for boycotts of Florida over its new anti-immigrant law. I don't know about you guys, but my truck will not be going to Florida at all. If we all came together as one community for Rogel Aguilera when he was facing injustice, I'm pretty sure we can all come together as a Latino community and boycott Florida as a whole. Because what they're doing to our brothers and sisters out there is not fair. For more, we're joined by two guests in Florida. Andrea Reyes is an immigration attorney based in Jacksonville. She's featured in the nude piece by Geraldo Cadava for The New Yorker magazine, headlined Florida's Right Turn on Immigration. Cadava is a professor of history and Latino studies at Northwestern University, author of The Hispanic Republican, The Shaping of an American Political Identity from Nixon to Trump. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Andrea Reyes, I want to begin with you in Jacksonville, and thank you both so much for joining us. If you can talk about exactly what this new law lays out, including Someone can be arrested for driving an undocumented migrant across state lines? Yes, thank you for having me. So SB 1718 has been the um, harshest immigration bill that we have seen, harsher than the series of immigration bills that we saw back in 2010, 2011, uh, with the Arizona uh, bill under Jan Brewer. But what it, what it originally was uh, designed to do was actually uh, a lot more draconian than what the final bill ended up being. Um, and that's what's created a lot of fear and havoc in our immigrant communities um, on, a, on a state and, and local um, level. Uh, originally, the bill was supposed to um, uh, criminalize anybody that was helping, basically, transporting, harboring, uh, housing an undocumented immigrant in their home. Um, they could be subject to up to a 15-year penalty. The final bill provision actually um, states specifically that a, an, a person who drives into the state of Florida, an undocumented immigrant, and really there's a very specific ver, um, word, and it's an, uh, an immigrant who um, entered without inspection. Um, so the state bill itself uses the word inspection, and in federal law under the INA, there is a very specific definition for inspection that does not match the state definition of inspection in the bill. So there's a lot of controversy, and we, we expect to see a lot of controversy um, with that specific provision because it is very vague and overbroad. Um, as you stated in your introduction, uh, the bill also does require hospitals to provide uh, hospitals who re uh, receive Medicaid to report uh, quarterly reports to the governor's office and to the legislature about um, 
the immigrants that are receiving uh, assistance in their uh, their hospitals. However, what's very tricky about that bill is that it, there's actually an ex there's a there's a provision, um, and it's specifically written into the bill that allows for the hospitals to um, select decline to answer. Uh, so immigrants are actually like allowed, you know, they're going to be able to decline to answer that citizenship question. But of course, right, you're telling immigrants who naturally don't seek a lot of medical attention as it is because they don't want to accumulate the bills, they don't want the attention, they don't want, um, you know, people asking questions about their immigration status. Now they're going to ask those questions uh, despite the fact that they have an opportunity to decline to answer. So inherently, there's going to be a lot of fear in that as well. Another big provision of the bill is that, uh, as you know, there are about 19 states and the District of Columbia that provide licenses to undocumented immigrants. And so there's a lot of immigrants currently in the state of Florida that have lived in other locations or have families in different states, and they've been able to obtain licenses from other states. Um, this bill is now going to make it so that um, if an immigrant is stopped and they have a driver's license from an another state, the police officer can exercise um, their authority as if the person was driving without a license, which means they can ticket them and or they can arrest them. So, I mean, those are like the big three things um, as well. Uh, you know, there's the, the section for um, non-citizens who potentially have their bar license right now are not going to be able to continue having their license, I, I believe, starting November 1st, 2028. Um, so we have a lot of DACA recipients, as we know, who uh, don't—it's not, a, a, it's not a, a permanent legal solution to their status, but it, it does provide some stability through work permits and Social Security um, for them to be able to stabilize their lives. But so a lot of these individuals who don't, who are not U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents, will no longer be able to hold um, licenses. Um, it also creates a provision for law enforcement to have to mandatory cooperate with ICE um, on any. Um, um, you know, uh, any programs that, that where an, an, an undocumented immigrant might be um, processed. So there's a lot of things in this provision and in, in, this, in this bill, and what makes it really terrifying is the amount of provisions that it had. Um, a lot of the previous bills that we've seen have focused on, like, you know, two, three, four items. This, you know, had, I think, over 12 provisions that directly affect immigration. Geraldo Calava, you have written a book uh, on the Hispanic Republican. Clearly, um, you have Ron DeSantis preparing to run for president, um, and he feels this will help him, whether we're talking about the abortion ban he just signed or uh, when he says this is where woke goes to die, Florida and the don't say gay bill. Um, and now you have this immigration law that's going into effect. It seems to be pillars of his platform. Uh, can you talk about why he feels, with a large Latino population in Florida, this will help him win a national audience? Talk about the makeup of Florida and also Latino Republicans. Yeah, that's a great question, Amy. And uh, I just want to say thank you for having me on. I also want to say quickly, Andrea, it's nice to meet you here. I mean, we spoke while I was writing the piece, but we had never met. And so I just want to say that you're the one doing the work on the ground, and I'm just uh, reporting on it. So it's nice to see you here, and thank you for the work you're doing. So I, I definitely think that this bill is related to Ron DeSantis's presidential ambitions. I mean, I think he probably correctly perceives that the national mood, especially within his own party, is against making it easier for immigrants and asylum seekers to settle in the United States. And so he thinks that if he can show that to be true, to, to be that he's doing something to be uh, effective on immigration in his, own, in his own state, he might also become a good national leader on this issue as well. But I think it could be a miscalculation. I mean, Florida is in some ways unique. He has, through gerrymandering and uh, voting restrictions, engineered this situation in Florida where he has 28 Republican senators and only 12 Democrats. And so he can push through almost anything he wants to push through. But I'm not sure that what he's trying to do in Florida will translate nationally and, in fact, gain him uh, wide acceptance on a national level. I think Florida's Latino communities are somewhat different than other uh, Latino communities. I mean, historically, they've uh, thrown their support to the Republican Party for a long time, for decades. And in November 
of 2022, 58% of Latinos voted for Ron DeSantis, even despite the uh, airlifts to Martha's Vineyard and other places. So I think that in Florida, you have a much more conservative Latino population. I think what's interesting there lately is that it's not just Cuban Americans and Venezuelans who are shifting their support to Republicans, but also Puerto Ricans and Colombians and others. Mm. I mean, it's interesting you bring up the um, Martha's Vineyard trip, taking undocumented immigrants, people, asylum seekers, putting them in a plane, flying them to Martha's Vineyard. Andrea Reyes, I mean, they're talking about arresting people um, for uh, driving with people who are undocumented. He flew them. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 hypocritical, right? We're saying that you, uh, you we can't have people come into the state, but we're going to take people out of other states to other jurisdictions. Um, it's an overreach of his power as a state entity, and I, and we you know we again we believe that because of the. Um, overreach that he is, you know, doing through immigration—he's trying to enact immigration laws through state law. Uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has already ruled that immigration—that the federal government has plenary power over immigration. And so, only when the, the federal powers give, you know, any authority to the states can they actually implement anything uh, related to immigration. So, the fact that he's trying to create immigration enforcement through state policy is going to become a constitutional issue as well. So you're an immigration lawyer, Andrea Reyes, and you've been doing this for a number of years, um, from Trump uh, through Biden right now. What do you demand of the Biden administration, and how much power does Biden have right now in the face of these Republican governors, everyone from Abbott in Texas to DeSantis in Florida? Yeah, so I think um, Geraldo and I actually spoke about this in the article. Um, we can look at any president, we can look at any administration, and it's never going to be enough. Whatever a president does when it comes to the immigration world is never going to be enough, because all they're doing is putting a Band-Aid on an open wound. Um, you know, a president can't fix the problem, the, the broken, delayed, strict immigration system that we have. They can't fix it. Um, in fact, our Constitution doesn't allow for it. Only Congress has the power to create the laws to fix these problems. And, you know, for for decades, Congress has refused to act on, on sensible, common, you know, positive, sensible um, immigration reform. And uh, we look at, look at the DREAM Act, for example. The DREAM Act, uh, the first version was created in 2001. That's 22 years ago. That's a whole college student that, um, you know, in, in terms of age, that we have not been able to come together. We've presented, I think, 11 or 12 versions of that, of that Dreamers Act bill, and Congress has not been able to come together. I think the last time that we had a real chance at passing it was in 2010. Um, but since then, you know, we've presented new bills and nothing's happened. This is the most likable, the most susceptible, the, the most deserving immigrant population, right, the Dreamers. And we can't get Congress to act on behalf of Dreamers. So at the end of the day, People need to understand that, yes, a president, when you, when you go to vote for presidential elections, it matters. Absolutely. All elections matter. But that's the thing. People think that only presidential elections are going to fix their, their problems when really, especially for immigrant populations, right, the, the, the Congress, the Senate, our senators and our elected uh, representatives are the ones that have the power to build and create the laws that we need to protect us. And so until, I, I think a big part of this movement that's going to come forward as a result of SB 1718 is all these young Latinos, I'm hoping anyways, the same thing that happened um, after Arizona in 2010, um, you know, we're going to have all these young, um, vibrant uh, Latino uh, nonprofit organizations, grassroots movers, you know, kind of teaching and educating the population on not just, like, what our um, political system looks like, but, number one, you have to leave your baggage behind from your country. Whatever happened in your country is in your country, and that has a different constitutional order. Uh, here in the United States, we have a, you know, we have separate concepts that really help us. Separation of powers, right? What, what saved us during the Trump administration were the federal courts. Um, you know, federalism, this idea of, like, what is a plenary power for the federal government, what is state power? Um, 
Um, so if we if we if we can educate our our the immigrant population, um, if we can get voters registered, you know, if we can get people to register for voting, um, you know, I think in the state of Florida, if I'm not I might misquote it, but I think there's like a 40 percent of, um, of current permanent legal residents are eligible to vote, and they haven't registered to vote because a they don't the English right that is always an issue, but also they don't trust the system and they don't believe in our way of government because sometimes they're stuck on how their government operated in their home country. I wanted to bring and, Professor Cadava back into the conversation. We only have about a minute, but you speak to Jose Rodriguez, a priest in Florida, who says many conservative Latino voters are prioritizing anti-abortion laws over immigration. And if you can talk about that and whether you think that will change as this becomes more and more extreme. Yeah, well, one one of the things I was interested in exploring is how this law might be seen by uh, religious, religiously motivated Latinos. And I was thinking that the bill would kind of pull them in different directions because, on the one hand, they've long supported immigrant rights and the idea that immigrants are neighbors and members of our community, at the same time that they are increasingly uh, kind of supporting anti-abortion bills and, and Ron DeSantis's other pretty radically conservative legislation. So when I spoke with Jose Rodriguez, I wanted to understand how the Latinos he works with see this bill. And he was saying that he thinks that conservative Latinos are now prioritizing anti-abortion because they've kind of gone all in on the conservative movement. But he thinks that it could have, uh, you know, it, it could have a lot of blowback or a lot of negative consequences for them as well, once they realize all of the negative effects of the immigration bill as well. So he, he thinks that right now, uh, conservative Latinos are just elevating the anti-abortion issue over the immigration issue. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. But of course, we'll continue to cover this issue. Professor Geraldo Cadava, we thank you for being with us. Professor of History and Latino Studies at Northwestern University in Chicago. We'll link to your piece in The New Yorker magazine, Florida's Right Turn on Immigration. And thank you to and Andrea Reyes, an immigration attorney, speaking to us from Jacksonville, Florida. And that does it for our show. Democracy Now! produced with Renee Feltz, Mike Burke, Dina Guzder, Messiah Rhodes, Nermeen Sheikh, Maria Tarasena, Tammy Warrenoff. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.